get organized here in a minute. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Not what any of us expected. But I have to think that if we're talking about divine sovereignty, that he is not taken by surprise that this is the passage we're looking at this one. It also occurs to me that one of the burdens of this passage in Romans 9 is the question of the Jews, has God abandoned them? Has he not kept his promises? And Paul's going to respond, well, not if you understand the promises correctly. And so in times like this, it's easy for us to think, well, God has abandoned us or abandoned uh, Jesse and Kara, but he has not. He is still gracious. He is still keeping his promises as we understand them uh, and embrace them. So we will look together uh, uh, at a few verses in Romans chapter 9, verses 14 to 29. This is ready. Did I do that or did you do that? I did that. <laughs> you want everything? I want everything. <laughs> yeah, you're good. <laughs> Oh, oh, sure, fine. Uh, I thought you meant control. I want control. Um, Romans 9 to 11. The big question, just to remind us, the big question we're looking at in these chapters, 9 to 11, Book of Romans, is how can Jewish unbelief and divine election be harmonized? If God has, in fact, chosen the Jews, then why aren't they embracing his answer through Jesus Christ? Uh, Taves writes, Paul's gospel was to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Everywhere Paul went, he preached first to the Jews because they were God's elect and chosen people. His experience was more like to the Gentiles first and a few Jews also. And so it's like, wait, this isn't really adding up. So it raises this question, had God in fact abandoned his promises to Israel? If, if Christ is the answer and they are elect, why aren't they embracing Christ? And they were not. And if that's true, if God's election of the Jews didn't sort of guarantee their acceptance of Christ, did that mean then that God's promises to those of us who are Gentiles, well, they may or may not work also. So it's an important question, I think, for Paul to answer and say, no, God's election is in fact perfected. And for the Jews, it might have been not the question, is God going to keep his promises in Christ? But the question for the Jews might have been more like, wait, and how is it right for the Gentiles to get on our promises? Those are our promises that God made to us. Who, who let them in? So our quick overview of these three chapters, God's promises rightly understood, Paul insists, have not failed. God is a promise-keeping God. Christ is, in fact, the fulfillment of those Old Testament covenant promises, and God has not rejected Israel, even as he includes the Gentiles. It's not, it's not a zero sum here. You can, you can add these in. Uh, these, these chapters, 9 to 11, I, we must not forget, are very israel centered. It's not that others don't get involved, and it's not that we're not in there, but they're very much israel centered. So it's important to kind of keep that uh, in our mind. And a fun fact, I like fun facts. Uh, chapters 9 to 11 have the highest Old Testament citation rate in the entire Pauline uh, corpus or, you know, text in, in Scripture. 35 of the 90 verses in 9 to 11 have an Old Testament citation that's about 1 in 3. That's 39% actually. Romans 4 comes in at 28%, and the next concentration is Galatians 3. So this is a highly concentrated Old Testament reference. My clicker's working. So chapter 9 specifically is addressing this question, has God's word failed? Uh, two weeks ago, uh, Aaron addressed this. I think you did a great job. If you were here, as I wish you were, uh, I would thank him. Uh, and so, has God's word failed? Verses 1 to 13, he said, no, God's word has not failed because the identity of Israel has been misunderstood. Paul says, not all who are called Israel are really Israel. Not every single Israelite um, 
belongs to the promise. Because the promise doesn't actually follow natural descent alone. None of us uh, have our place in God's plan because of our parentage. This is true for Jew and Gentile alike. So inclusion in the promise uh, involves something beyond our natural descent. It involves God's election. It involves some subset of those natural descendants. So has God's word failed? No, not if we understand who it applies to. And today we're going to look at verses 14 to 29, and we're going to try to respond to a couple of objections. Like, wait a second, how does this work? I don't like it. So we're going to respond to the objections in, in verses 14 to 29, in which I explain all of the mysteries. <laughs> <laughs> Even though many commentators are, you know, aren't very optimistic. Pate says this is a most difficult passage to preach and teach. I sympathize with that view. Uh, Griffith Thomas says the passage is long and difficult and can hardly be understood or right. Unless it's taken as a whole. And we ain't taking it as a whole this morning, so <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Chapter 9, verses 14 to 18. <clears throat> is God unjust to exercise sovereign election? Here is the passage. It follows verse 13, where he says, As it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hate it. And we talked about that two weeks ago. Verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. This, this is a strong objection, like no and no. By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have compassion on whom I have mercy. Excuse me, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or human exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth <clears throat> is God unjust by no means and then he <clears throat> brings up this case of God exercising mercy with Moses where he says to Moses I have mercy on whom I want this is from Exodus 33 19 and it follows the case of Israel committing uh, idolatry with that golden calf and uh, Moses and God are having a discussion. God said, I'm going to wipe them out. Get out of the way, Moses. And Moses said, no, 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 please don't do that because it's not going to give you a good reputation. And then later God reveals himself to Moses because Moses says, show me who you are. It's in this context, after this huge uh, sin on the part of Israel, that God says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I want and I will have compassion on whom I want. In that context, if God had not chosen to show compassion, he would have correctly obliterated his elect people because they had broken the covenant. But he says, I didn't want to. And so I didn't. And there's some suggestion here that the reason God was showing mercy to the Israelites was not only for their sin, but also for the whole world to say, See, he was compassionate to his people. He can be compassionate to us. It is his nature to be compassionate. Now, it's interesting, again, to think from, the, from a Jewish perspective that the Jews in, Roman, in the Roman church probably didn't have a problem with God's election because they were chosen. Like, we're God's chosen. Yay for election. <laughs> problem for them was, wait, you're elect too? That's not how we understood it. So God says, I am free. I will show mercy to whom I want. I don't have to just show it to Jews. Now, if we think about God being right in his mercy, Paul says, we can also think about God being right in his judgment. And here he looks at the case of Pharaoh. This is from Exodus chapter 9, in which 
God and Pharaoh do this dance of Pharaoh resisting the uh, demands of Moses and the people of God to be released from bondage and slavery. And God providing plagues, and then said, we still won't. Um, so there's this dance of sort of upping the ante until finally, Pharaoh says, okay, go. Uh, and then he changes his mind, but we know this story. It says here, verse 17, where uh, the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. For this very reason I raised you up, God has sovereignly decided to work with Pharaoh. This raising him up does not mean that God created Pharaoh as a, as a resistant being, but it does suggest that God knowing who Pharaoh was and what he was like said, yes, I'm going to give you uh, this powerful position because I'm going to be able to use you to show the world that I am strong and that I will rescue my people, even from someone uh, as powerful as you. And God did this not to, how would you say, uh, torment Pharaoh. He describes his purpose as being to show that I am a great and mighty God so that people will believe that I can save them. That's often pointed out, or we often struggle with this idea, as expressed in the Old Testament, that God sometimes hardened Pharaoh's heart, and sometimes it says Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And we could talk about um, who did what first or when. I think it's important to say it was a mutually agreeable relationship. <laughs> Pharaoh uh, agreed. Someone put it this way, the more Pharaoh resisted the will of God, the more he had to. I don't know if you like that, but it's interesting. And I don't think that what happened in Pharaoh's case is altogether dissimilar from what we saw in Romans chapter 1, where God said about the Gentile sinners there that they just really wanted to commit these sins and refused to acknowledge who God was. And so God said, fine, okay. That's how you want to play? You play that way. He gave them over. So I think in some sense... That's what's happening with Pharaoh here as well. He was already uh, intended that way or inclined that way. So I think Paul is saying that, that withholding mercy here is not unjust. God is just in his judgment of Pharaoh as well. So is God unjust? No. He's consistent with his own character. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he he wills. So what is the standard of justice? I think the suggestion yeah. here is that it is God's own character. Because God doesn't need a reason to show mercy, because he can have mercy on whoever he wants. He is free and sovereign. That doesn't mean that he doesn't have a reason. It just means he might not have explained it to us. If it's mercy that God gives any of us, then by definition, if it's mercy, it cannot be claimed and it cannot be earned. If it's mercy, it's mercy. And withholding mercy is not unjust. So it's also been pointed out that if we don't want to accept God's active sovereign mercy, our alternative is to accept the judgment that we have so richly earned, as explained earlier in the book. Is God unjust? Paul says, no, he's not. He, uh, he is righteous in his character and in his choices, even though we don't always understand them. And so then the follow-up question from Paul's readers, as he anticipates them, is, well, if God is so sovereign, then why does he still blame us? Verse 19, you will say to me then, why does he, God, still find fault? For who can resist his will? 
But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Paul's going to say that this is the wrong question. It's interesting. His first response to this objection is not, oh, well, that's interesting. His first response is, I don't like your attitude. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you think you are? Oh, man. What, you're going to call God uh, into the dock? But the question wells up, doesn't it? It may not be the right question, but it's the question that we have. And Paul sort of goes after it. Verse 19, you will say to me then, well, all right, I mean verse 21. I'm having a little trouble with my text here. I'll just pick up at 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault or can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder? Will what is formed say to its former? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? God as creator has the right to shape his creation. This is not the only time in scripture that, that we have found this potter and clay analogy. I'm going to read to you uh, from William Barclay's commentary. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't support this um, approach, but I think we can relate to it. Barclay says about this potter and clay analogy, it's a bad analogy. One great New Testament commentator has said that this is one of the very few passages which we wish Paul had not written. <laughs> Maybe you can do what you like with a thing, but you cannot do what you like with a person. Clay can't think and feel. Clay can't be anguished and bewildered and tortured. The idea that God can do what he likes is the mark of a tyrant and not of a loving father. It is a basic fact of the gospel that God does not treat man as a potter treats a lump of clay. He treats them as a loving father treats his child. But even Barclay acknowledges, we can't blame this on Paul. Paul is quoting an analogy that's used repeatedly in the Old Testament. Isaiah 45, woe to him who quarrels with his maker, to him is but a potsherd among the potsherds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Jeremiah talks about that as well. So I don't think we have the right to judge scripture here the way that Barclay suggests. I, I think that we have to be judged by scripture. But I think it's also important to acknowledge here that this is a limited analogy. It's not saying here that we are inert like clay. It's not an attempt to explain every aspect of our relationship with God. This is not a, a summary statement of all that's involved. It is a claim that God has some right over his creation and that we are one of those creations. It's also been suggested here that if we use this potter and clay analogy and, and press it out a bit, ooh, press it out. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> the potter is not responsible for the composition of the clay. He's just responsible for the shape he makes of it. So you, you might want to argue that God takes us in the condition that we are and he makes from us then an appropriate vessel. But the assertion here is, that God has the right to shape his creation. But along with that is the assertion that God's good purposes in election have to be achieved by a sovereign act. Verse 22, what if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make, his, make known his power, what if he has endured with much patience 
vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. What if God? There's a dis significant distinction here, if you notice as I read through, uh, between the objects or the vessels of wrath and the vessels of mercy. In the objects of mercy, it's very clear who did the preparation. God did. He took positive action to grant mercy and include these vessels in his plan of blessing. The objects of wrath, on the other hand, were prepared. They were fitted, and the passage doesn't actually tell us by whom. So, who prepared the objects of wrath? Perhaps God did. Luke 12, 5 says, he can harden people and even throw us into hell, if that's what he wants to do. Here's an interesting comment, though. When God hardens someone, he does not change them from neutral or innocent to guilty. He hands them over to the consequences of their own sin. God can harden. It doesn't say that he did. Perhaps these vessels hardened themselves. Perhaps they themselves prepared themselves for this wrath. Chapter 10, the very next chapter in Romans, is going to explain that, in fact, this is what happened with Israel. It's not that they were innocent and doing everything they were supposed to do, and God was like, nah, not you. They were responsible. It says they refused to submit to God's righteousness because they said that we want to do it ourselves. We know from many passages in Scripture that it is God's desire uh, that no one should perish, that all should come to repentance. But what we can also say for sure from the first part of Romans is that none of us actually deserves to be vessels of murder. If you accept the first three chapters in Romans, you have to say, we're all guilty, we all deserve God's judgment. And I love the phrase there that he says at the final judgment, every mouth will be silent. When we see reality and ourselves as we really are, says Paul in Romans, nobody's going to say, but wait, that's not fair. We're going to be like, eh, eh, eh. You're right. That's how it was. But I want to be clear here that God's purposes and election, again, are positive. God's eternal purpose is to bring many sons to glory, says Hebrews chapter 2. Not to generate a population for hell. That is just not God's plan to try to fill up hell or to try to find people that he can zap. That is not what we find in Scripture. And why did God work with Pharaoh's stubbornness for so long? Why did he just say, you're in my way, boom. He worked with him patiently so that the world could understand that God is a God of great mercy for his chosen people. He did this to make his power known to the world so that more people would be motivated to seek out this gracious and merciful God. So even in this judgment of Pharaoh, there's a view here to the overflowing of grace to the whole world. And the last verses here are just a series of quotes from the Old Testament, which Paul says, in the Old Testament, in the Jewish scriptures, if you like, it is anticipated that the Gentiles are going to be included in the covenant promises, and that, in fact, not every Israelite is going to be saved. It's only going to be a remnant. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people, and her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you're not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. This is a quotation from 
Hosea chapter 2 and Hosea 1. If you read Hosea, it's pretty clear he's talking about the Israelites. But what Paul has the freedom to do here is to say, it's also true for the Gentiles. That though they didn't used to be the people of God, God has said, no, you are. And in fact, you are sons of the living God. This was a, this was a, uh, a well-loved description that the Jews thought of themselves as sons of the living God in contrast to the Gentiles. And Paul says, no, it applies to the Gentiles as well. So here's the anticipation, Paul says, in the prophet Hosea, that many who were not part of God's plan will in fact be included in God's plan. And then the opposite is going to be true. Verse 27, and Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Many Jews, Isaiah says, will not be part of the covenant blessing. And if God had not sovereignly intervened to, how would you say, positively save a remnant, if he had left them to their own devices, Isaiah said there wouldn't have been any left. But God sovereignly acted to say, I will save a remnant. There will be a remnant of faithful people who belong to me. Griffith Thomas, the very fact of God's election of remnant was a proof of his kindness, not his severity. For if an elect seed had not been preserved by divine power, the whole nation would have rushed to a doom similar to that of Sodom and Gomorrah. As I said, you solved all the mysteries <laughs> and, uh, in, in just a very few minutes, apparently. <laughs> there are three views on election, and we're not going to spend much time here. You're probably familiar with the outline of this, but, but we have the Calvinist view, which emphasizes God's sovereignty, which says, you know, God has determined everything before time began. There's, there's nothing that we can do about it. Uh, his calling is, is irresistible, it's permanent, uh, we are uh, on and on. But it, it takes God's sovereignty as sort of the starting and ending point, and that's all it fits, that's all that matters. There was a reaction to that, it's called Arminianism, in which it emphasizes human responsibility. Um, if, you have, uh, if you have time, you can look up the, uh, the remonstrance in which the five points of Calvinism are systematically objected to in this remonstrance saying, no, that's not true, it's this way. And in fact, we as people, we, we can decide. God has given everyone grace to respond, and, and if you say yes, you get to be part of the covenant, and if you say no, well, then you get what you deserve. There is also, and I think this is very interesting, the idea that the election in this passage isn't talking about individuals at all. It's talking about peoples. So that, so that this question at the individual level, while it's interesting, and while we can't say that individuals aren't caught up in these peoples, peoples are made up of individuals, yes. But the thought here is this election is not about individuals. It's about peoples. It's about why is it that the Jews as a people who were elect as a people are not as a people accepting the gospel? And how is it that the Gentiles as a people who were not God's people are now being invited to be part of God's people? Uh, so we can think, for example, of... Uh, uh, Achan and Rahab, in which during the conquest, uh, you know, Achan, a member of the, of the chosen elect people, 
sinned and was stoned to death. And Rahab, who was part of the, the nation that the people were going to destroy, she is saved. <laughs> she becomes part of God's people. So you see, it's sort of a, a people-based thing, and individuals don't always um, follow this scheme. And think of also the fact that Paul has just said, not all who are Israel are Israel. So we're talking about peoples, perhaps. Additional comments. <clears throat> uh, very quickly, Israel has not been totally displaced. Uh, when you get to chapter 11 in your coverage of Romans, you're going to find that there's still this promise out there. Paul says, and so all Israel will be saved. And, and someone will, uh, will discuss what all Israel means for you. But it seems clear from these passages that God isn't done. He has not, in fact, abandoned this idea of his elect people. So they haven't been displaced. Uh, there's no room for anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, the history of Christianity uh, is full of anti-Semitism. And just put this out there. That's not a biblical idea. God loves his people. Uh, must we choose uh, between Calvin or Arminius or those two ideas? I'm going to say no. <laughs> I, think, I think in Romans especially, maybe, maybe beyond, Paul has a tendency to just drive a point all the way home, step back and say, yeah, that, but also. <laughs> and if we just stick with this, we're going to not catch the whole message. That's why I, I think, uh, you know, we're supposed to take the passage in its entirety, because chapter 9 focuses specifically and insists that God is free as sovereign creator. Chapter 10 follows right behind it and says, and Israel is responsible because they have rejected the Messiah. Both of these things are true. So this, this, this dilemma of God actually being free and sovereign and us actually still being responsible um, is a great problem for the Western mind, it seems. If, if you want to get into the philosophy of all this, then you should look up Molinism and start talking about middle knowledge and all this sort of thing. Uh, that's very interesting, but scripture doesn't address that. Scripture doesn't seem to have a problem with this. So many uh, commentators have said, this is an antinomy. This is something we can't actually resolve. It's a mystery, and we shouldn't try by logic to sort this all out and wind up in one of these two camps. Um, I believe this as well. I believe scripture affirms both of these principles, and I don't know how to sort it out. Maybe it's because I have a weak or lazy mind. I think there are people who would accuse me of both. <laughs> Hopefully not all of you by this time. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was intrigued and a little annoyed that one of the commentators I was reading went so far as to call himself a Calminian. I was like, no, no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Not that. <laughs> Here's a better summary. These two truths, God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, are to be believed firmly, held tenaciously, proclaimed fully, and our life is to be lived in the light thereof. Do we have to choose? I don't think so. Remember again, this whole section on God's faithfulness is to the Jews as a people. His inclusion of the Gentiles is as a people. We all know not every Gentile and every Jew fits these categories. We can't pretend there aren't individuals involved in, in these elections, but we can try to keep our focus where scripture keeps the focus. And Paul, at the end of this extended dialogue about God's sovereignty and election, he doesn't say, this is really a confusing and sort of sordid discussion. He ends it with, 
a doxology and says, so, 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 so God elected Israel to show the nations who were not included that they're now included. And the Gentiles started out as vessels of wrath, and now they've become vessels of mercy. And the Israelites as a whole are now vessels of wrath in the same way that Pharaoh was, and in the same way that God used Pharaoh to show his mercy, God is using the rejection by the Jews to show the Gentiles that he's merciful, like the parts have been moving, but the thing that is consistent is that God is showing mercy. Mm-hmm. And he says, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Who could have thought that up? And I'll end there. We have uh, no discussion. So, Andrew, uh, back to you. Thank you for uh, bearing with me this morning. May the sovereign God be praised.